you've just been pulled into the, the boardroom and the CEO's there and the other VPs are there and they call you in and the CEO looks at you and says, the, the board is kind of concerned. Our turnover is higher, some of our numbers are down. They want us to focus on culture. And all eyes turn to you and they say, what is the plan for our culture? What is our cultural blueprint? And what do you say? What information do you have there on the spot? Do you have the, the science to back up your ideas? Do you have case studies? And do you have all the information you need not only to inform them of what a good plan might be, but to inspire them to follow you? So hopefully this workshop, this seminar, will answer those questions and empower you to have that information so that at this meeting, you can inspire this, this, these group of leaders and all of the leaders in your culture. So let's dive deeper. And I'm a researcher, and one of the things that I've been researching for years now, the question that came to me early on in my career was, what is the one thing that motivates all people to work? And so here we're going to start interaction already. Jump in the chat. And what's the first impression that employees give you is the one thing that motivates them? What do they often say? Let's hear. I hear money. That's always what I hear first. And then people in the chat are saying, oh, that they, they want to accomplish something big. They want to be known for who they are. These are all things that they often hear when I speak nationally around the world. I hear things like, yeah, money motivates me. Or I want to enjoy my job. I want to have things in the office that I like. And I want to be able to do, show up at a place that I enjoy every single day. And I want to accomplish that big dream. These are kind of the, the three big categories that all these different answers kind of fall into. Let's look a little bit deeper. And the first thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to do a little experiment together, okay? Since I'm a researcher and we experiment. So I, wherever you guys are, so nobody can see you. So you're going to be doing a pump experiment. You, you've just joined Pumps or Us. And uh, the powers of be said I can pay you a penny a pump as we go out. And we're going to try to do this for the next hour. So you, you'll get a good workout and you'll learn something. So there's a bonus. And if you do this at about this pace, that's about... 7,200 pumps a minute, you're going to make about $72,000 a year if you keep doing this for the rest of the year. So see if you can just do it for the rest of the hour. And oh, bonus, I have this little detector that if you, you do this and you stick your hand on the computer, I can tell how well and motivated you guys are. And, and, and oh, oh gosh, you guys aren't doing very well here. And in fact, most people don't keep pumping for more than two seconds because money is not what motivates us. In most cases, what happens is when, when the money just becomes a fairness issue, and once that fairness ratio is met, money is no longer motivated. People are not, no longer motivated by money. So let's move on to that next hypothesis. What, what, it, what would it look like to have a job that you really enjoyed for the rest of your life? So let's, let's go to an extreme example. Like this guy has great hair, of course, and he's a great tennis player. This is Andre Agassi. He gets to play a game for crying out loud for every day of his, of his work. You know, he just gets to swing that racket, hit the little ball. What could, be, what could be worse? You know, what could be better than that? In fact, when he shows up for work, he's got 10,000 people going, Yay, he's here! Yay! And people are cheering him on. That's pretty awesome. He gets millions of dollars doing it. In fact, and he was the number, he was the best guy in the world at doing this. So he had to be rocking it and enjoying it, right? So, you know, he won the U.S. Open, the French Open, the Australian Open, the Open Open. If it was open, he opened it. He won the Olympics. He was number one in the world, riding high. And so he had this to say about his career in his autobiography, okay, called Open, of course. And uh, he said, let me let you into a little secret about winning. He said, winning changes nothing. He said, how could I have my own plane and a bank full of money and still not be happy with my work. He went into a downward spiral after that. He ended up on methamphetamines. He got divorced. He was throwing his rackets. He ended up in the amateur leagues. Once he discovered that enjoyment was not enough. So what else could it be? What about that big dream, that big meaningful type of work? Now, this is me back when I had hair, back when I had big dreams, of course, and Dreams drove me through most of my life. So let's examine this as a case study to see, can dreams, can that big dream really be the thing, that last one that really drives you through your workplace? And, you know, I was an artist, and um, like my daughter, who's also an artist, you know, she came to me in, in like about that same time that I had the curly hair, and she, she said, Dad, 
what am I going to do with my life? You know, I, I'm an artist like you, but I'm not sure I, I want to do that for the rest of my life. So I had a story that I could tell her because she was in despair. She had that college angst of like, I could change my major, but maybe this isn't enough. So I had the story to tell her about the big dream. I said, Ashley, what I wanted to do when I was your age, I wanted to be an artist at first, but then I thought, let me dream bigger. Let me become a social worker and, and I could change the world. I'll go to a foreign country. And my story started here in Athens, Greece. I was going to change this country. I was going to reform the poor. I was going to change people's, encourage people to live different lives. That was a big dream. I could do that for the rest of my life. And here I was driving down this street. This is actually called Marathon Street in Greece. And this is where that ancient runner 2,500 years ago was running for his life. He just, they just won the battle of his lifetime at, at Marathon. That's why it's called Marathon. He was running to the king of Athens to tell him. So that was, there was I. I was running for my life too. But you know what happened to that runner? Once he got there, he told him, we won. And then he died. He ran so hard. Well, while I was driving down this street, I was dying too. And in fact, I closed the visor on my helmet while driving down the street on my little Euro scooter to keep the smog out of my eyes because I wasn't running through crystal clear air like that ancient runner. There was smog from all the, the buses and the cars and the trucks. And it was dark, but I didn't close it just to keep the smog out and the darkness out. There was a darkness inside of me that I was just screaming mad, ah! screaming out loud inside my helmet where no one else can hear me in my despair. I was like my daughter. I chose the most meaningful thing that I could find. And in three short months, my dream met my manager and it died. How could someone kill the dream that I had that I thought could last a lifetime? Well, while I was feeding the poor out on the streets, he was shoving shame down our throats at every staff meeting. We were never enough. We were never good enough. We were doing this in a modern European city and he worked in the jungles of Yuri and Jaya when he was our age. He raised lots of money. He built up a fleet of planes. He did all these incredible things. And what were we doing? We weren't working hard enough. He stayed up until 3 in the morning last night and he was sick. And we went to bed on time. We were never enough. Shame was always the hallmark of our meetings. And I felt horrible, abandoned, desperate, alone. I was in a crisis. But the crisis is not just me. It's not just Ashley. It's the 40-year-olds, the 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds. What are we doing? Why are we working? What's the one thing that motivates us? And we find out that th this is not unique. What do we tell these people? What do, how do we inspire people as HR, as leaders? What do we tell them? Well, Gallup has shown that the average team kind of lines up like this. If we were to imagine them, the team, as a, um, a tug-of-war, the first three are actually kind of pulling in every team. There's three people that kind of do their work, and they pull. We call them engaged employees. Then the next five, they're the biggest cohort in every team. They're just sort of hanging on. They're not engaged. They're not pulling. Like when the boss comes, they look like they're pulling. And then when he's away, they're, they're on Facebook or whatever. They're just, they're not giving their all. And it shows, you know. And then there's the last two that actually ended up kind of like me at that place. It's like, this place is no good. The fun with this job. The fun with this work. They're actually disengaged to the point of, and they're disgruntled. They're actually trying to throw a wrench in the machine. They're complaining about life and work. So that's the average team. 70% are disengaged. 18% are working against the organization. Let me highlight a few other things. Gen Z, 75% quit for emotional issues. What, have they been in the workforce for like six months now? But, you know, what about one day a week lost per employee? That's a lot of loss of labor and productivity. That's 20% according to Gallup. You might as well let them go for one day a week. That's how unproductive the average workforce person is, 70% of them. And these guys, you know, did they quit for, for crazy reasons? Did I quit? Did Ashley give up? Or, or is there something smart that they actually are doing? Maybe they're holding out hope. So what, do, what hope do we offer those generations that are giving up on jobs and the workforce? Let's look deeper. So let's return to that research question. If none of the above are really the answer to the question of what's the one thing that motivates all people, 
I find that when I ask that question, people often go to their left brain first and they try to calculate the answer. And they go, I could, I could work for that, I think. Yeah, that, that would make me happy for, for now. So what I've done is I actually found that everyone's right brain knows the answer to this question. So this is key as HR people, as professionals, everyone knows this answer instinctively. So what I did as a researcher is I changed the question to this. If you could choose just one thing from all eternity, what would you choose? So imagine we open a sci-fi portal into the future, into eternity, forever. And you get to take one thing from this planet, from Earth, into eternity. What would be that one thing that would motivate you for all eternity? And then I offer them the solutions that we've gone over already. Money, but that's all you get. You get money alone. You can purchase anything that you want in the world forever and ever. You never get an end to the supply of things that you could buy with your money. You get enjoyment alone. You get one game. You can play tennis. You can go mountain biking, fishing, skiing, whatever it is that you love. You could do that one thing for all eternity. Okay? That's all you get is that one thing. Or you could accomplish that one thing. Big dream. So for all eternity, you could save the whales. For all eternity, you could bring that big corporation, that nonprofit, build it, make it great. Follow that dream for all eternity. But that's all you get is that dream. Or I offer you number four. You could be surrounded by those who love and value you for all eternity. Now jump in the chat and, and vote. One, two, three, or four. What would satisfy you for all eternity? One, two, three, or four. Four, 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 four. four. Everyone all over the world in every institution that I talk to always says four. It's the one thing that motivates all people. 95% of the people I've polled choose number four. It's the one thing. It's the ultimate why that all of us work for. It's the one thing that motivates all people to be valued, to value people, to be valued and to value others. That's why we live. That's why we show up to do what we do in life. It's the one thing that people want more than anything else in this world is that feeling of being valued. It's universal, meaning like they've tried it across all cultures. I talk to CEOs. I talk to manufacturing line workers. They all say for. It unifies us all. It's the universal thing that, that ties us all together. And why? Because in our right brain, our bright brain is in tune with our body and our brains. It just knows that's right. That's true. And it's true for everyone. In fact, science confirms it. Not just my surveys, but surveys by the University of Arizona. They've gone all over the world, and they surveyed 7,000 different people in different, 40 different cultures. And they all answered the question the same way that you did. We want to be surrounded by those who love and value us. So how do we use that in business? And why is that? If we, we all know this fundamental truth, I can get the line worker and the CEO all, all to agree, yes, that's what we want. Why do we have this problem? Why do we have this crisis? Why do 70% of us not know? That's the, the other big research question I have. What's, what's happened? That's because most businesses line up at somewhere around this pathway of commodity culture. Okay? And we'll talk about what that means. It's a, a culture that doesn't value people. It values stuff. We're a business that makes stuff. So it's got to be all about stuff. And we're, we're about making money. So it's got to be all about making money, right? Or maybe a little bit about our money and a little bit about people. But there's also this alternative, what I call VP culture, value people culture. A culture where we value people. And that becomes the core of things. And we'll talk about that later. But let's talk about this pathway first. How did we get there? Why do we follow it? Why do people take this? And why is it creating this, cult, this, this crisis in our, our employees, in our workplace? Well, it's based on behavioralism. Back in the 50s when the science of management and leadership was starting to come into universities, behavioralism was the dominant philosophy. And it was all about punishment and reward. And we can get people to do things. According to science, it's a stimulus and response. You give a stimulus, and a reward, and people will do it. 20 bucks to jump through the hoop, and boom, they do. And then maybe a little bit more, and then boom, they do. And, you know, externals are most of the valuable to this science, and not people. It's all about getting people to move towards those external rewards. And it does work. This is why it's so confusing. It works temporarily. 
Okay, it works very, very quickly. People respond to reward and punishments and our brains are wired to fix, fixate and to operate in that way. But it needs increasing stimulus to keep going, okay? And in fact, uh, Mar Paul Marciano, PhD from Yale, wrote this book called Carrots and Sticks Don't Work. He outlines how when you use carrots and sticks, it actually starts to downregulate. It starts to destroy teamwork. It starts to destroy motivation because of the intricacies of this whole behavioralism system. It destroys value of people and starts to create value of the extrinsic things, the stuff of work, the goals of work. And why is this? We're going to delve deep into the neuroscience to actually find out what's going on in our brains. Why is this not working for us? It's because it's based on dopamine. Dopamine is the stuff molecule, to put it very succinctly, okay? Um, what it does is it focuses us on survival. We have to get the next good, the next thing, the next goal, okay? That's where dopamine wants us to take us, okay? And it's designed to do that. And when we get it, we get that little happy moment. Yay! We've all felt that, okay? So it does work. It's a functional system in our brain. It's designed for stuff and for goals and to move us towards things. And you think, well, that, isn't that what business is all about? But it's not designed to make us value people. Okay, and this has a deleterious effect. And in fact, dopamine in itself has a deleterious effect. It downregulates. It knows that if our brains know if we keep pumping out the dopamine at high levels for everything, you're, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. That's where addictions come from. When people get a, a shot of something that upregulates dopamine, like cocaine, they get addicted to it and they want more and more and more alcohol, things like that. And, and what they, they'll begin to pursue it with to the detriment of their own health. They'll take more and more and more because each time it downregulates and they need more of that same substance to achieve the same outcomes, the same high, if you will. So dopamine is associated with, with, with addictions and with negative outcomes. It's destructive to the user, ultimately, if that becomes the basis of who you are. In fact, so much so that this guy, Dr. Robert Lustig, wrote a book called The Hacking of the American Mind, that our minds are being hacked by dopamine because it's the system that we're using to lead people around our world with. Our leaders are using it. Our marketers are using it. Even the manufacturers of Doritos and food are all engineering everything to give you that one little dopamine hit. And it, it, it makes us to value externals and not people. Everything's a, 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 another swipe. I need to have another thing. Okay? And it seeks novelty. Always something new. It has to be new. It has to be more. It has to be bigger. It has to be better. So we're hacked by the food, the electronics, the marketing. And unfortunately, our management has taken up the call. Because it's very easy. When you don't teach people how to manage and to lead well, you don't have a blueprint for your culture, People will default to this because it works. I, I tell you no, I'll punish me. I'll tell you yes, I'll reward you. It's the very simplest form of leadership. Unfortunately, it releases cortisol, the stress hormone. So what happens when punishment and reward cycles happen? There are stressors on our system. Uh, what is out there, the rewards are limited. Okay, we, we, we don't all get the reward. So that causes stress. You're, and it says to you, based on, on, on the fundamental level, you are not valuable. Stuff is. Goals are. Money is. And this causes physical illness. Actually, 42.1% of absences are due to mental illness, according to scientists. Okay? And what's worse, there's a thing called presenteeism. Those are the ones that don't end up going home because of the, all the mental stress they're under. They just stay home. They stay at work, actually. And they, they're those hangers on at work of the rope uh, that are only doing 1.5 less times less work than if they, they had gone home, recovered, and come back. Why is this? What's going on in our brain? So this is a picture presented by, by Dr. Bruce Perry of what the brain kind of looks like. Okay, Our brain's highest functioning executive center is the cortex. It's what plans and, and, and is it does executive function and uh, has its values, does what it, does what it plans in the future. And then there's the limbic system, which is our emotional center. And then there's the diencephalon, which, which regulates our, our body. And then there's the, the brainstem that keeps the vital organs and hearts beating and things like that and takes care of us. And the key thing is here is, is that Dr. Perry pr uh, points out to us that these brain levels are, are 
state regulated. So if we're calm, we can use the highest form of our brain. When stress starts to come, our brain functioning starts to go down into the limbic, alarm, we start getting down into the panicky levels of our life, the lower levels of, of our brain start working. And what happens is it parallels with our IQ, okay? Your brain functioning starts to decrease to the point where you can barely even work. Your executive function starts to shut down. You start to work on emotion, survival, panic, okay? And this can happen. You know, most people might be living right around here in their life, but a little bit more stress and they end up down here. So you can see that the optimal workforce would be working in this place all the time, relationally. And what's more, there's these two neural modulators that we talk about, uh, dopamine and cortisol, that actually downregulate us. As when we focus on dopamine and cortisol, it pushes our brains down into these lower survival modes. When people are desperately wanting that reward, they end up operating out of lower systems, not, not higher cortical systems. So this is what happens to us. When we increase the stress and focus it on stuff and not on relationships, it decreases our, our overall functioning and our overall understanding of who we are because we don't feel valued. When you create a culture that's a commodity culture, there's no value. Okay? So let's look at the other pathway, this value people culture, VP culture. What does that look like? Well, it's based on attachment science. Okay? Attachment science is, is the science of where people are valued. And it has as a core theory, not about stimulus and response. It's about people and our brains developed by being valued. Okay? The fundamental wiring of human beings is about interacting in relationships where we feel valued. Okay? Started by Dr. John Bowlby in England. And in the 1952 as well, he was a doctor and he noticed that when little children were brought into his, his care uh, that were sick, and the, the proper English moms and dads would leave little Johnny at the, at the hospital, at hospital, and they would go away, um, Johnny wouldn't thrive so well. And then there was a few odd parents that would stay with their, their children instead of going home and leaving them. And he noticed a remarkable recoveries by those children. And so based on that experience, he created a whole theory and started studying in depth how we are wired to connect to people around us. And when that does, when that happens, it ha we start to thrive. And, and all of our neurological systems start to function better. So that's the theory behind the science of value and attachment. And in fact, it doesn't happen just in children. It happens in adulthood, too. So there's been huge studies done by how attachment works in adulthood. And think about it. Like, as we become adults, adult, you know, teenagers, are they more concerned about connection with others or less? No, they become hyper-concerned about the connection with others. And when they don't have it, they end up in a downward spiral, like we've been talking about. When they do have it, they begin to thrive. Ever hear like somebody say, oh, look at that teenager over there. He's in terrible condition because he has so many loving and caring people around him. You never hear that. It's always when they're alone and desperate that they feel, that they feel troubled and, and, and understood. But it's also true of, of people in the workplace. So attachment is being studied in the workplace. It's being understood as a primary driver. And now let's look at why this is. Because our brains are attuned to attachment, okay? And there's this major modulator. We talked about dopamine as a, as a neuromodulator, but the, there's a bigger one, serotonin, okay? Serotonin is why you all said, I could live with that for all eternity. Because what does serotonin do? It helps us to feel contentment and safety, okay? So in that contentment and safety, we could do all sorts of things. We could exist for all eternity. And we know it in our being because we all felt it. In fact, Harvard did a longevity study that started in the 1920s with this very question, what makes human beings thrive? And they found that people in healthy, thriving, attached relationships where they felt valued thrived. They were the ones that had the best families, the best health, the best outcomes, the best finances, the best jobs. They were most connected in the community. And those who didn't pursue that, who set out, I'm going to be the biggest robber baron of all, they didn't achieve it very well. Most of them ended up failures, alone, poor health, not economically doing well. So the longevity study proved this point through experience and through study. Why? Because serotonin gives us a signal to thrive. 
things are okay, things are safe, I can build, I can explore. It's the master modulator, okay? I was reading another book and it called Serotonin the master modulator of all the modulators of our brain. It tunes everything else. In fact, it called it the conductor. Everything else is just a player in the band. Dopamine's a player in the band. Cortisol is a player. But serotonin regulates dopamine. It regulates cortisol. It regulates your cortex. It regulates everything in your mind. And in fact, it upregulates oxytocin, which is another hormone that gets released. An economist, Dr. Paul Zak, has studied this. It's the foundation for trust in business because he's an economist, for crying out loud. He's not a neuroscientist, but he, he wanted to find out what motivated people in business. And it, it's when serotonin and oxytocin are released. There are no shortcuts, he said, or substitutes to success. Success is great, but no amount of money, achievement, or fame will satisfy our need for human attachment. And what is more, uh, serotonin upregulates thriving neuropeptides. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah, well, that's endocannabinoids, endogenous opioids. Yes, that's, that's uh, opioids and uh, pot. But they're endogenous chemicals that are produced within our brains, and our brains have receptors for these things. And when we're in healthy, thriving relationships, boom, these are coursing through your veins, and you feel wonderful as a result. So serotonin has an effect on this. And no wonder why people are turning to these things when there's an epidemic of loneliness in our nation. In fact, I think it's one in 25 people don't have anyone that they can talk to. So it's no wonder that 70% of our people are feeling lonely and disconnected and not valued. So those things are released in a positive way when you're in healthy relationships. And then there's this guy, Stephen Porges. He's another major neuroscientist, and he has studied this thing called uh, the social connection circuit. It's the vagus nerve, okay? It's the tenth cranial nerve, and it enervates all of your organs and, and vital systems. So it basically, when you're in a good social relationship, he noticed the connection. The serotonin modulates it and affects it and causes electrical signals to course through your body that say, life is good, time to thrive, time to go. So it gives you this positive energetic feeling, okay? So all of these things, instead of seeing this downward pressure down into these stressful places, this is what serotonin looks like on our brain. You guys ready? Woo! Serotonin upregulates your mind so that you're staying up here in this calm state and your cortex is working great. You're doing great executive functioning. It modulates your dopamine. It modulates your cortisol. All of the brain has fibers from the serotonergic systems that enervate them and cause them to be changed slightly. It's like, hey, things are good. Things are good. So everything in your body, your brain, is modulated by serotonin in, an, in a positive way to work more optimally, work more in, in an engaged fashion. So this is the, the master modulator. And it's cued by being valued by others. Fascinating science. So, you know, I just give you this picture. If your system, your culture is dopamine guided, your serotonin will be smaller. And usually what happens is people, you end up with this kind of result, that it ends up getting smaller. The direction is not like you're going to get more of this, you're going to get less of both. However, if your system is guided by serotonin because it upregulates all and controls all of these things in a positive, healthy way, you're going to get more serotonin, more value, and you're going to get more dopamine. So your goals are going to be met. All those other systems are going to fire in a very healthy, connected, safe way. So that's why our brains love this kind of culture. When we feel valued, things move in a positive, great way. Creating VP culture, value people culture. People feel valued. Okay, that's the, key, the core takeaway. And we're going to do a, a business study because a lot of times I think, you know, people say, oh, it's nice science, Ronald, but this is just business. It's just dog eat dog. It has nothing to do with all that neuroscience nonsense. So let's do a case study. And I like to use Southwest Airlines as a good example. Why? Because they're not in some unicorn industry where they thought up some new technological thing and they were a thousand miles ahead of everyone else before they started. No, they started in the airlines industries back in the... 50 years ago, when it was super competitive, they were the underdog. In fact, when they first started, they had to fly point to point, okay? 
instead of point to hub, which is 20% more efficient. That's why all the big airlines do it. They fly to Chicago, they fly to Houston, and switch planes and then fly out from there. They fly point to point, not because it's a better idea, because it's less efficient. What else? They had less capital, they had to compete by lowering prices so they got less money in, and they had to compete with a less efficient model. But what did they have going for them? They had what we're talking about. They have at their core valuing people. They have a value people culture. Okay, that's why ha they have these hearts on all of their planes. And they're not just you know, saying this. Their CEOs are serious about it. Their chairman of the board is serious about it. It's the fiber of their very being. Okay, so with that as the differentiator, how did they do as an airlines in this very competitive industry? Okay, well, they had 50 years of profitability. You're like, well, don't all airlines get are profitable? No, they are not. In fact, the, the airline industry has, in that 50 years, posted a net loss. Okay, this is one of the few airlines that has been profitable. Not only that, but profitable every single year in depressions, in hard times, they've made profit. They have more stock value than all the others combined, more productivity, the most productive employee of all. And you think, well, maybe they just don't have unions, Randall. Actually, they're the most unionized of all the airlines. When they have the lowest turnovers, very few layoffs. In fact, they, they have pledged not to have layoffs. They had a slight furlough after the, in the midst of the COVID crisis, but that's it. They have the highest sa safety record, the highest satisfaction record, and, what, and the largest airlines in the United States in 50 years with this one differentiator. And you think, well, maybe, maybe you just have it wrong, Randall. Maybe that's not really the differentiator that made the difference. Well, let's ask Herb Kelleher, the former CEO, his opinion about this. He said, for those who think leading with love is simply soft management, review the record of Southwest Airlines over the last 50 years. From these results, it can be factually and logically concluded that if you seek long and continued success for your business organizations, treat your people as family and lead with love. That's Herb Kelleher's summation of what made Southwest a success. You think, well, maybe, maybe Southwest is just some weird outlier. Well, I think we'd be wrong. Let's look at this guy. Who is this guy? This is the trillion dollar coach. You probably never heard of the company he used to work for, Intel. And uh, his name is Bill Campbell. And unfortunately, Bill Campbell, he, you know, Bill Campbell used to coach a few little guys in, in Silicon Valley, Valley. Their names were Steve Bezos, Jeff, Steve Jobs, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google. You know, he was involved in over a trillion dollars worth of business as, a, as an executive coach. And what do you think these three guys, unfortunately, Bill has died. These, these three guys got together and wrote a book. And one of the key things that they wanted to communicate about Bill was was this. Bill valued people. He made you feel valued. Whether it was the boardroom or the Powder Puff football team. In fact, one time there's a story where he's coaching little girls on the Powder Puff football team and he goes like, look, Steve Jobs just called me up. Voicemail. Because he was present to those little girls. They were valuable to him because he was there with them. And he made everyone feel like that from those little girls to everyone in, in the business in his business associations, okay? And they made that clear. That was critical to these three huge executives' success. And Gallup is also has studies across, meta, meta studies across different industries. And they found that when people feel engaged, valued, there's 37% lower turnover, 48% fewer safety incidents, and higher stock value, higher profits, of course, all of these indicators are going to follow where people are thriving, okay? Where that VP culture exists, this kind of outcome exists. It makes sense. And just a reminder, during that time of our case study of the 50 years, here's 77 airlines that filed for bankruptcy during the time that Southwest was succeeding by creating a value culture. So if you're environment is a competitive environment, okay? This might be the one differentiator that will keep you off this list and ahead of the comp competition because it's that 20% differentiator with this kind of VP culture. So there is a business case for this, not just a scientific neurological case for creating this kind of culture. So oftentimes I end up with this, okay, 
We all agree. That's, that's, you know, most of the HR people are, are we're already sold from the beginning. They're, I'm preaching to the choir. They already wanted this, this kind of VP culture. And the, the question becomes like, well, why don't we all have that if that's what we all want? Well, the big question is you need a culture blueprint. Okay, most of the people that I talk to, when I go around the nation, I ask them, do you have a culture blueprint? They say, well, you know, we have pizza Fridays. We have, we have casual Thursdays. They have a few things, but they don't have a plan for their culture. Okay, I've lived in other cultures. Cultures are invasive. They have different language that you have to speak. They have different norms that you have to adopt. And in order to become part of it, you have to jump in with both feet. And you have to have a, a culture blueprint. Okay? So here's the blueprint for VP culture based on the ultimate why. The one thing that motivates all people could be broken down this blueprint can be broken down into three sciences. And these represent personality science, which studies a person in their, from their past until now. Emotional science is something that engages with them in the present. So it's important to understand this as leaders. And then value science projects values into the future. So these three encompass a person with the feeling of being valued in an organization. You need to cultivate the past, present, and future in these three domains, in these three sciences. So that's the cultural blueprint that makes up a VP culture. Let's look into personality science. This is incredible to me. Personality DNA has been discovered. It was one of the biggest discoveries of the 20th century. We know the five factors that make up human, human psyche and personalities. And does anybody know what they are? Five words. Most people don't understand them. And it's, most organizations don't use them, most leaders, most CEOs are completely unaware of this, this discovery of massive proportions. It's built on 30 years of research. It's one of the most widely studied social sciences. Okay? In fact, it's become a law of psychology. That's how well it's been validated, how good the testing is. Okay? This is the type of thing that we have as a tool within our reach so that people, and they've done it all peoples of all ethnicities, all genders, all ages, the, val the test is valid. And it works across all of these cultures and all of these domains. I think they've done it in like 50, 60 different countries at this point in time. Why does this appeal to us? Because one of the fundamental things of human beings, and, and particularly in the workplace, we want to be known and appreciated. Okay? And if you knew what the five fundamental things were of every human being, and you could lead people towards that, they would feel known. Gallup did a leadership study, and those who felt led towards their own personal strengths of their personality felt uh, proportionally more engaged in their workforce. People don't know themselves. In fact, the primary reason why this book, why this technique is used, is to keep people out of jobs that they think that they want. People don't know themselves well enough. They'll, they'll take a job that they probably would hate for the rest of their lives. So we give them a test to keep them out of that job that they would probably hate. Incredible, is it? We don't even know ourselves. In fact, think about it. Can you name the five personality traits that are out there that have been scientifically discovered? Most people can't. They can't even name the words, let alone how, how much they are, or how much their spouse is, or their children are, their employees, their teammates. It takes an investment to learn another language. When I went to another culture, I had to invest a lot of time to learn that language. This takes a little bit of investment, it's, but you only have to learn five words. Can you learn five words of that language and invest in that? What would happen if we did? Well, we'd have these superpowers. First of all, the leader would be able to accept differences as, as, as good. Okay? The different people on their team each bring a different personality trait that's a strength, not a weakness. How many leaders do you know that lead to weaknesses. That's what I've experienced most of my life. They, they find out what's wrong with me and then they lead me to that. It's like, thanks, look at who I am, not what I'm not. Because we all have portions that we're not. All have things that we have. You can predict people's perceptions. You know, if you announce that there's going to be a big software change and it's great new software, you'll know exactly who on your team's going to think, that's scary! And the other people will be like, that's great! They'll perceive it, the same fact, as being wonderful or horrible. But if you know personality science, you'll know who on your team will, will be able to perceive that fact differently, and you'll be able to adjust it for each person. 
You'll be able to predict behaviors of other people. Every, every personality has behavioral tendencies, okay? So you'll be able to say, that person's probably going to like this job. That person's not going to be like being isolated by themselves. That person's going to love the analysis of this thing. So you'll be able to nail all these things and use these superpowers as leaders in your projects. So let's do a little quiz here amongst ourselves for fun. Introverts, type me in the chat there. I know we have a lot of you out there because 60% of my polling shows that HR people are actually mostly introverts, 60%. So we've got a few of them out there. Great, there you are. So here's your question, introverts. Your turn to sound out. Do extroverts treat you like you are an extrovert? So introverts, do extroverts just assume that you're an extrovert? Yes, of course. That's what I always hear. It's like, so this fundamental trait that, that is one of the words that is in our common language that we hear about all the time, extroverts, introverts, most people are blind to it. They don't even see it. Most leaders are just like, yeah, everybody's an extrovert. Let's all treat them like extroverts. And that's not true. Okay. So that, that affects them deeply when you feel mistreated according to your personality. So if you imagine if everyone was connecting and understood each other's personalities, their differences, their similarities, and then we're just meshing, people would feel valued, of course. So that's the, one of the foundations is personality science, knowing people's pasts in order to engage with them. And what do we want to do? We want to engage with people in the emotional present. You know, this is what's not something that, you know, the guy that I worked for in Greece, he obviously didn't know my personality and he wasn't able to do this either. So we weren't able to move into a future full of values. So this is a critical step in the present. Can you engage with people in the emotional present? Now, Amy Edmondson is a big researcher from Harvard Business School. She wrote a book about the fearless organization. And how does it become fearless? Well, they're emotionally safe teams. And she had a theory that emotionally safe teams would have great effective outcomes. And so she did a massive study, I believe in the Boston area, studying different hospitals and seeing which, so she posited that uh, the most emotionally safe teams would have the most effective outcomes. And she found exactly that that wasn't the case. Wait, what? Yeah, her research pointed that that wasn't the case. And she's like, wait a minute, that shouldn't be. Um, so she looked at the data a little bit more closely and she saw that they were self-reporting their outcomes. Hmm, she said. And so she, she hired a secret researcher to follow behind the people and to record you know, the actual outcomes for those two teams and the data switched. It was the emotionally safe teams that were actually properly reporting the outcomes and they actually had better outcomes. The emotionally unsafe teams were falsifying their outcomes because they were afraid. They weren't emotionally safe, okay? So the emotional science, according to, to Amy Edmondson, was the foundation for these teams that had high outcomes and good reporting, by the way. <laughs> so. Most of the theories about emotions that you read in the, in, in the older uh, uh, management literature is about either hide or banish emotions. And this is like kind of our, our primary instinct. Put it behind a smile. You know, like, how is it going? Everything's good. How are the outcomes? The outcomes are good. Well, all these emotional things are going on behind the scenes. Okay, or banish those emotions. Leave them at home. We don't want anything to be feeling here. This is work. But you really can't. And these, these people can actually detect a false smile because it comes from a different area of your brain. There's a, an, a subcortical uh, area that causes a genuine smile that shows your true emotions. And then there's a, a higher cortical thing that says, okay, pull back the muscles, make it look like a smile. So there's a difference. In VP culture, we have genuine emotions and can do things with them that are effective and carry. So this ball guy, Another great ball guy. Uh, his name is Steve Hayes, and he wrote a book called uh, A Liberated Mind. And he's the founder of the theory of ACT that's been in the workplace for over 30 years. And it's a different approach. It's not like I'm going to banish my emotions. It gives us perspective on emotions, okay? It helps us to be mindful about them instead of dismissing them as irrelevant, okay? It causes, this causes us to be less reactive about emotions, according to his research, okay? So it's curious, and it gives us freedom to act out our values, which we'll talk about later. So emotions aren't controlling us anymore, but we're not dismissing them at the same time. So how does that work? Okay, that's about operating in the present and being emotionally flexible 
instead of emotionally dismissive as our, as our operating system. We have a better operating system. So he gives this exercise that, that it's called, you know, so imagine like you had an emotion like fear written on your hands. And I like it on your hands because it gives you this idea of like, one of your hands is your body. What does your body feel when it's fear? Ooh, your heart is beating, your lungs are going a little bit faster. You can feel that adrenaline and that cortisol coursing through your body. So your body feels up. And then you have this thought. So feeling of body and thought like, oh crap, my, my boss just sent me an email and said, come to my office. Of course, that's going to be bad. <sighs> There's fear written on your hand. And when, we, when we're reactive, fear is right up in our face and we're bumping into things. We're saying, I'm going to blame it on my coworker. I'm going to blame it on the vendor. It wasn't me. It's my boss's fault. He never gave it to me on time. Or what would happen if instead of being emotionally reactive like that, you could gain perspective. You could go, wow, my body really got amped up on that. And my thoughts were like, he's going to have something bad, but maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. If it is, I'll just use my values of like, I'll work hard, I'll own what I have to own, I'll do what's right, and we'll just go on from there. And you give yourself a little bit of grace, and you walk into the office and you find out like, hey, I've got some tickets for you for a baseball game that I can't use. Oh my gosh, I overreacted. So having that kind of perspective is important. But, so here's the thing, people don't realize that we don't have complete control of our thoughts. And they don't realize that we don't have complete control of our emotions or our bodily sensations. Okay, those subcortical systems get going before the cortex is even aware of what's going on. So what ACT is doing is helping the, the cortex just sort of be aware that the body might be ahead of us. So let's, let's do an exercise about our thoughts first. Can our thoughts be out of our control? Yes, they can. So let me try to challenge you for the next 30 seconds to do this exercise. I want you to think about nothing. No thoughts for the next 30 seconds. Ready? Go. No thinking. Stop that thinking. Don't think about anything. Not a single thought. Okay. That was about not 30 seconds. Did anyone have no thoughts? Are there any super gurus out there that could just blank the mind out? I don't see anybody out there. Usually I don't get anybody. I may get one person like, I did it, you know. Um, but thinking about nothing is next to impossible. So if you don't have complete control of your brain where you can just say, hey, I'm going to shut everything down, you're not in control. Actually, the brain bubbles up all sorts of thoughts of things that you, like you're driving down the street and you go, where's my phone? You weren't even thinking about your phone, but your brain thought you needed to check on that. Okay? So we're not in complete control of our thoughts, but accepting our thoughts is just coming and going like leaves floating down a river. Just watch them come, watch them go. It's okay. And evaluate them, appreciate them. And now, what about our bodily systems, okay? I want you to stand on one foot, okay? And, and notice things. So you can see me doing it. I'm standing up on my toes, which is even harder. And, you know, I'm talking while I'm doing this, but I'm not thinking this. I'm not thinking big toe, little toe, lean to the side, lean to the calf muscle, calf muscle. All of that's happening with subcortical systems. I've got lower motor neurons that are on circuits that don't even make it to my brain that are making adjustments based on my vestibular uh, activity in my brain and it's all happening without me having to think oh blood blood send blood you know send electrical signals I don't have to do a thought my body takes care of it all and the same is true with our physical emotions those happen in about two milliseconds our, our cortex goes oh what's going on about six milliseconds and so there's about three cycles that your subcortical systems have already turned on when you get that email that says come to my office your subcortical system goes alarm alarm and gets your body going before you can even say, wait a minute, wait a minute. So what ACT does is it tells us, you know, in charge of your thoughts, you're not in charge of your body, but you can focus it after the fact. So it causes us to not to try to control everything that's going on in our bodies and our minds, which causes rumination like, oh crap, why am I thinking that? Oh crap, why is my body doing that? It gives us acceptance. It's like, okay, my body's doing that. Okay, my body's thinking that. Now what do I do? So it's a different approach to being emotionally present. See, and here's the key. Most people can't do that for themselves. You can see when a leader can't do that for themselves, they can't do that for, some, for the people that they lead. And so that causes those emotionally unsafe teams. It's like emotions are big, scary things that the leader can't handle. They can't handle your emotions either. So everyone starts falsifying the tests, running from each other, not knowing how to do anything emotionally in an engaging way. But when you do feel engaged, 
Wow, that makes all the difference. People feel valued. When leaders have this kind of emotional intelligence, this ability to assess their bodies, assess their thoughts, know what an emotion is, and have these uh, effective outcomes, people feel valued. So that's the emotional science. And let's move on to the third rung on this row of sciences, the value science, okay? Now, value science is about the future. And it's, it's, it's also um, talked about here in ACT and also in logotherapy from Viktor Frankl. And we'll talk about him a little bit more in the future here. So it's the future of valuing people. Now, ACT points out the difference between goals and values, okay? Goals are dopaminergic. They lead to stuff and outcomes and they end, okay? They have a finite point in end, like, let's get these numbers on the board. You, you do that sales thing and you got them, done. Goal done, okay? Values lead to people forever, okay? Let's keep treating people like they matter forever. Let's treat our customers the way we would treat our family forever. We never, we never get there. We might accomplish things along the way, but it's a fixed point in the future that you just keep going to. It guides your life forever. You never get out of values. You just keep going down that pathway, whereas goals are these little bumpy things that you come and go, and they could be things that you can't reach. When valuing people comes your, becomes your vision, you will thrive. Okay? So, when I talk about valuing people to financial, when you put your valuing people first, your financials will line up behind that. That's, that's what the case study after case study has shown, that in business, when you shoot for people first, your financial will follow up because you're valuing your customers, you're valuing your teammates, you're valuing yourself. It creates a thriving environment where everyone is, is going forward. And a good example of that is Southwest versus United. Southwest decided like, or United said, hey, United's do, or Southwest is doing so well, let's copy their business model, their goals. So they copied all their goals and made a small airlines to copy everything that Southwest was doing. And it never surpassed what Southwest was doing because they didn't adopt the values of Southwest. It was Southwest's values that made the difference, not just their business processes. Though they had good business processes, their values are the things that guided them through all of those right decisions to get to the right place. So here's something that Viktor Frankl points out, okay? Levels of values, and this is something that people don't see in their businesses, because most people, most businesses start on this level, according to, her, to uh, Victor Frankl. They do creational values. They say, this is what we make. We make widget X with integrity and quality, which is true. It's a good thing. But they never ask, they never answer the question, why are we doing this? We pump water with integrity and quality. Well, why? Well, let's see. They... If they ask the question why, maybe we want an experiential value. We want people to have clean water. We want them to go in their homes and have great experience when they turn on their water. They feel safe. Okay, so we want human beings to have an experience. Like Starbucks makes a great cup of coffee, but it's not just coffee that they're passionate about. They want people to have a, an, an experience at their facilities. That It's a home away from home. Okay? And so... But I, I have challenged companies, and this is what Viktor Frankl says, there's, there's, there's a value higher than experiential values. And when you ask this level of why, you'll get to these ultimate values. So we create cups of coffee so that people experience a home away of home. Why? Why do we do that? Because people are valuable. People are intrinsically valuable. Dare I say that people are sacred. And we all are working in the sacred service of other people every day of our lives. And when we have that attitude towards life, we have that supreme value, doesn't matter what I think. The guy that's giving you the card at Walmart or the CEO in the corner office, I'm serving people. And that's why I show up every day of my life and I get the opportunity to look someone in the eye and say, how are you doing today? And give them value every single day because they're worth it and I'm worth it. So when organizations rise to that level of values, of, they project a future look that we're doing this for people, period. And we create all of these things for people because of you, for them, for each other. It ignites something special in an organization. In fact, Viktor Frankl discovered this whole principle when he was in a concentration camp. So he took his, his life work. He showed up at the concentration work with his, his manuscript of his book. They took it away, burned it. Life work, gone. Sent him over to dig dishes. 
horrible, no, no great experiential values there. He was walking barefoot through the snow. No creational values, no experiential values. But what they couldn't take from him was the quintessential thing that he mentions here. He says, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth that is set in song by so many poets and proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers that the truth, that love is the ultimate and highest value to which man can aspire. And then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and thought and belief have to impart that the salvation of man is through love and in love, the highest value, valuing others. You can lead people to no higher point. And when people sense that you're leading them to the highest place that they want to go to, people feel valued. Their past is valued. Their future is valued. Their present is valued. You're creating a blueprint of, of valuing people. And when you become, when you have leaders that are great at this, they move from the sciences of understanding and executing these things to the art of VP culture, where your leaders are inspiring people by their behavior, by their lives, and they, people say, I want to be like those people. That place changed my life. I, I, that was one of the best places I've ever worked for in my life. What if that leader way back in my early 20s inspired me with this kind of like, wherever you go, value people. And in fact, there was inspiration that happened. Andre Agassi figured this out, this principle of valuing people. He realized that he wasn't playing for himself, he was playing for his fans. That he went out there, even though his knees were shot, he gave it his all and he began winning again because he was playing for others. And he set up a foundation that, that set up charter schools in Las Vegas for kids and his winnings went to that. And he wrote a letter to his son. He said, never forget that life is about valuing people. And I was able to tell my daughter in that story. I didn't leave her with, just have a big dream or I hope the pumping works. No, forget about life. Just get, make money and survive. No, I was able to tell her when valuing people becomes your vision, you live victorious. And yeah, she joined the uh, Missouri National Guard and is taking a social work major. Yeah, she's going to serve people. But she knows that no matter if she was painting or, or working anywhere, Valuing people is what life is about, and nobody can take that from you. And that's what makes life worth living. And I'd like to leave you with this last story from the Southwest Airlines, because it kind of encapsulates what it is to value people in a workplace. It's a letter to Southwest Airlines. It says this, Dear Southwest Airlines, I'm writing to comment and gratefully acknowledge the fine service my husband and I recently received on one of your planes. My husband returned to Norfolk, Virginia after being deployed in Iraq for one year. Our flight home from Baltimore to Long Island was the last leg of a long journey for him. The flight became an unforgettable, beautiful memory for us both. Your employee, a flight attendant named Sandra, took the time and effort to not only thank my husband for his service, but asked that everyone on the plane do the same. As we began to exit, the passengers clapped and thanked and congratulated us. We both began crying during Sandra's detailed account, announcement about my husband's service in our life together. And we continued crying as we made our way up the aisle of the plane. It was such a relief to finally believe that someone appreciated the sacrifices that we and our family had made. And as touched as we were as exiting the plane, we were floored to find that your employees on the ground were waiting outside the plane for us to present my husband with a bottle of champagne and as well as their thanks. And I was extremely in touch when someone, one of the employees leaned over and said, and let me thank you for what must have been a major sacrifice in a difficult year. And as we entered the gate area, every person waiting stood and applauded a man they didn't know. All because of the caring, valuing actions of one employee named Sandra. Please extend our greatest appreciation for, for Sandra's creation of our treasured memory which will last a lifetime. Customers Deborah and Peter Ellison. Touching people, creating value, valuing people. So it brings us back to this table. What would you say? I hope now that you could be empowered by it, with the science, the neuroscience, the case studies. But what is more, I hope that you are inspired by the art of valuing people. That passion that already exists in your life can be ignited with new passion and new inspiration to all those people, those leaders around you, the leaders that you lead, 
the people that you could affect, that you'll go forward from here and create a VP culture where people are valued all day long, everywhere, wherever you're surrounding and whatever adventure of life that you're in.